Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. man teaching on the purpose of woman, what could go wrong? <laughs> if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Genesis chapter two, uh, true story. I was in uh, California earlier this week doing some teaching and then I flew back in and I only had Thursday uh, in the office. So I came in on Thursday and dudes were literally coming by my office just to make sure I was all right. And you ready for this weekend? I'm like, I'm not going into battle. I'm preaching the Bible. I think we'll be fine. One dude hugged me like it was the last time he was going to see me. All right. I was like, I'll be fine. We'll talk about it afterwards. So uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, we are on the back end of our series that we've entitled A Beautiful Design. Uh, what we've been talking about um, is God's purpose and God's design in uh, men and women and how we interact with one another. And so up until this point, we have almost exclusively talked about the Imago Dei or us being made in the image of God, the difference between men and women and every other living thing in, in regards to us having uh, an increased value above and over them, not to be cruel, but to steward appropriately for human flourishing. And then uh, we got into manhood. And we've talked about uh, manhood right up until last week. The majority of the sermon was on manhood as we read the very text that we'll read today in order to move us towards the purpose of the woman. And so we said, um, this is the purpose of the man. This is what makes a man a man because biology makes one a male, but does not make one a man, correct? So biology means that my eight-year-old son is male, but it does not, his biology does not dictate that he is a man. In fact, he's male, but not man. I'll lay it down. I've watched him. He's not a man. All right? He's a male, and in the same way, biology makes my daughters female, but it does not make them women. So there's this other component, this other piece that makes biological males men and biological females women. And so we dove into that on the man. And here's what we said about the man, that God's role for the man is something that we defined as headship. And here's how we defined it. Male headship is the unique leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. We were unapologetic about that definition and have not backed down from it in any bit because there's no way to argue in any domain against that sentence, all right? You wanna look at it sociologically, you wanna look at it economically, no one could say with any intellectual credibility that the home is a better place when there aren't men there. All right? What's best for children is fatherless environments. What's best for daughters is a man not to be anywhere near them. What's best for women is for men to have no interest. No one would argue that. You couldn't argue it sociologically. In fact, the numbers say that the very opposite is true. Where men refuse to be men, things crumble. They fall apart. They turn to dust. You can look at it sociologically. You can look at it economically. You get into the poorest communities imaginable and hear what you'll find. Fatherlessness, broken marriages, absentee dads. Now, with all of that said, I'll never say that sentence without following it up with this one. Single moms, widows, where the ideal is lacking, grace always abounds. Don't lose heart. In fact, uh, I've said, and I need to do it, 
um, I need to preach a sermon on how God responds to the prayers of mamas. Like all throughout the Bible, mamas cling to the feet of God and plead for the lives of their son, plead for the lives of their daughter, and God responds. Now, sometimes he takes quite a bit of time before he responds, but he responds. It's a beautiful reality that where the ideal is lacking, where maybe God help you, you got invo- involved with a boy who could shave, where, where you got caught up with a guy who looked like a man. He just ended up not being one. And, and now you have a child or you have a, that God's gonna enter that space and he's gonna be merciful and gracious. And so don't lose heart. Now, how is a man to exercise? How is a man to exercise um, this headship, this unique responsibility to order things for human flourishing? Well, we saw from the Bible uh, that, that he is to do this with sacrificial love. So see, one of the first things we have to talk about when we're talking about masculinity is that men give and boys take. Men give, boys take, right? Like my eight-year-old, what marks him as a boy right now is he's still a taker. He's not a giver, he's a taker. That's mine, what about me? How about mine, right? That's taking, that's how little boys act. It's not how biblical, godly men act. Godly men are self-sacrificing for the good of the wife, for the good of the child, for the good of the church, for the good of the community. Self-sacrificing love is a mark of biblical masculinity and it is the only way that true headship is ever exercised or practiced. Where men are takers and try to operate in headship, they tend to be uh, oppressive, that they tend to rule with an iron fist. They tend to be this false, bravado, insecure masculinity that reeks of the stench of death. I don't know. Men aren't takers. Boys are. Men are givers. Self-sacrificing love marks the headship of men. Um, Men practice headship not just in sacrificial love, but also in setting up the spiritual climate of the home and the church. We create environments in which um, God and his word are seen clearly, worshiped passionately, and, and where the understanding in our home is we serve the Lord. And again, you gotta put these things together. It's not that he sets the climate with an iron fist. No, 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 he sets the climate with sacrificial love. And then finally, the man exercises headship by providing physical care. Uh, and, and we went, I don't, I don't wanna repeat you know, old sermons, but um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean he's the primary breadwinner, but it does mean he's not lazy and his life is marked by hard work. There is no place in biblical masculinity for lazy men. And in fact, I'll tell you that the lazy men that I have come across are some of the most miserable and some of the most damaging human beings I've ever come across. God has not designed the man to be bored. He has not designed the man to be lazy. Where a lazy, bored man is anywhere in sight, destruction and death are around him. And so we, that's how we defined the role of man. And, and so now we wanna do the same thing out of the same text when we talk about women. And so let's look at this together. Genesis chapter two, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called every living creature, that was his name. And the man gave name to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he formed into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the woman were naked and were unashamed. Three things stand out about this text in regards to ancient Near East manuscripts and thinking. One, here's the first one. This isn't the sermon. This is all free. 
all right? Um, the first thing that stands out in this, outside of it being scriptural uh, and just looking at it as a historical document, one, there's one Eve made. Now, that sounds like a no-brainer to us, but in this day and age, this is a polygamous world where women are viewed as cattle, and the more women you have, the wealthier you are. And God goes, no, 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 all you need is Eve, Adam. Creates one woman. He pulls the woman from the man's side with the connotations of intimacy and closeness. He didn't, in the narrative, he doesn't pull woman from the back, all right, from the spine, from the behind. He pulls her from the rib that she will be intimate and close with the man. And then the last thing is it would have been considered and was considered scandalous that a man would leave his family and hold fast to his wife. So and, until we get some of this, the wife had better come into the man's family. But God's going, no, no, no. Time to leave mama, bro. That, that's, that's, that's not how it reads in your text, but that's what's happening, all right? <laughs> Time to leave mama. All right, now, now you, you've got a wife, yes, a part of this bigger family, but your loyalty, son, isn't a mom and dad anymore. Your loyalties belong to your wife. You will leave mother and father and hold fast to your wife. And ladies, do not help me be the Holy Spirit right now. I'll be like, yeah, I'm telling you, mama, you always listen to your mom. <laughs> Don't help me. I need your help. Be hijacking my sermon. Now, with, with that said, what we saw concerning the man is that he was placed in the garden and he was commanded by God to work it and to keep it. And that's where we got our idea of Headship. Well, those two phrases, work it and keep it, is what helped us define the man. Now, what we were given phrase-wise concerning the purpose of woman is this phrase, and every word in the phrase matters. If you don't have all the pieces, you think wrongly uh, about what the purpose of woman is. And here's the phrase that's used twice in this text, a helper fit for him. A helper fit for him. And we'll break up that phrase into two ideas. A helper fit for him. And so both of those are going to matter. And, and so th this word helper is a difficult word in the Hebrew because it's highly contextualized. The words around it are the only way to make sense of what it means. Let me give you an English equivalent. The word fast in English is a difficult word. It can mean speed. It can mean abstaining from food. It can mean stubbornness in position. He holds fast to his position. And it can also mean a type of shady deal, fast business, fast dealings, a type of shady way of doing things. The only way to know what one is talking about is to take that word and put it in a sentence. So if I say yesterday morning I was at my son's football game and there was a kid there that was fast, no one's going, you mean he didn't eat any food while he was at the game? No, you're not. You know exactly what I'm talking about because the context dictates the word. If I said there's a young woman that we're good friends with that is on a 20 day fast, you don't think she's doing wind sprints in the front yard. You know, oh, she's abstaining from food. If I tell you about pastor friends of mine that hold fast to biblical truth, you don't think I'm talking about speed or shady deals. You know because the other words around the word fast dictate the meaning of fast. And this Hebrew word ezer is very similar. It's used throughout the Old Testament and the context always matters. But I'll say more about that soon. But here's the big debate around this word help. Um, the debate in light of this text is do women have, as helpers, a subordinate role to the man's in human flourishing? Now, we know and we've already covered that women are equal in dignity, worth, and importance, so that's not the issue. And we're not talking about do women have to be subordinate to any and all men? That's not, we've already covered that. No, they do not. So the question and the debate around the word helper here, the word help is does the woman hold a subordinate role to the man's in the task of human flourishing? Now, a couple of things that we have to consider so that we define this word correctly, we understand this word correctly. Um, number one is that when ezer, that's the word in Hebrew, is used, it is most often used for how God engages with man. 
All right, so the word help, Ezer, is most often used in regards to God helping man. And so let me give you a couple of these texts. Exodus chapter 18, verse 4. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, Eliezer, here's, here's kind of the meaning of his name. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. God is my helper. Deuteronomy 33, 7. And this he said of Judah, hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him into his people. With your hands contend for him and be a what? Help against his adversaries, right? So God is our helper. One more, Psalm 33, verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our what? Our help and our shield. And so uh, here's what I would say. God being called helper throughout the scriptures brings honor to the position of helper. And since God has been called the helper, a helper cannot be inherently inferior. So if woman has been made a helper fit for him, a woman as helper to the man cannot mean the woman is inferior in any way. So with that said, what does it mean to be a helper? Well, in every context in which Ezra is used and even how we use the word helper to this day, helper denotes someone helping the one with primary responsibility. You tracking with me? To be a helper is to help someone who holds the primary responsibility. If Josh Patterson comes to my office this week, knocks on the door and says, Chandler, can you help me with this? He is not asking me to do my job. He is asking me to do something that he has been tasked with that he is too weak to accomplish. And so he is asking me to come help him. So strength isn't the question here. In fact, the one that's being helped is the weaker one who needs help in order to execute upon their primary responsibility. So although to be a helper is not inherently inferior, it is to come alongside the one with the primary responsibility. But to say that a woman who is helping is somehow inferior to the one with primary responsibility is to make the accusation that God is inferior for the help he gives his children. It's absurd. So she is a helper fit for him. Not a helper like him, but a helper fit for him. See, this phrase now, fit for him, leads us to uh, the idea of complementarian relationship. The man and the woman were created um, unique by God, both in the image of God, equal in dignity, value, worth, but they have been meant to complement one another, not compete against one another. That the weaknesses of the one are strengthened by the strengths of the other. And the strengths of the other one are, are made even more strength by, strong by the strengths of the other. That there is a complementarian relationship where, where men are being men and women are being men, women in that could have gone bad. Uh, that goes back to week one. We don't have time. Uh, if, if that happens, then you have the type of human flourishing that, that the Bible commends that if we'd be willing to walk into it, our joy might increase. God's glory might be seen all the more brightly and all of our hearts would be satisfied in him. And where we buck against this system, bad things happen. But let's talk about it. What we did with the man is we said, uh, okay, let's look at this in the home and let's look at this in the church because ideas are ideas, but ideas take place on the ground, right? So ideas are great until you implement them, huh? And so let's, let's implement these things. What would it be like for women to help the man in the home in regards to God's command on his life to order things so that humanity might flourish? Okay, in, um, in Ephesians chapter five, but that's not the one we're gonna cover. I'm just mentioning this. We're gonna go to Titus two because I want you to watch these things at work. But in um, Ephesians chapter five, there's this great passage about husbands and wives. And everybody, when they talk about husbands and wives, wants to start in Ephesians five, verse 20, that reads, wives submit to your husbands. 
And, and yet, if you roll it back to verse 15, you have this idea of mutual submission, all right, before wives submit to your husbands. And so you've got this kind of guideline for Christian behavior before you ever get to wives submit to your husbands. And what he means by mutual submission is what we've already covered, that men who are exercising headship must do so in a way that is marked by sacrificial love. We show deference. We include. We want to know. We desire interaction. We value the intellect of our wives. We value the gifts of our wives. We encourage and speak life into our wives. So we walk in mutual submission. We don't come home and go, this is what we're doing, woman. It's not how we work. That's not headship. That's bullying. And you won't get away with bullying God's daughters for long before he lights you up. I mean, go ahead. You can rumble if you want. It's going to go bad. I mean, listen, I'm not scary, 6'5", gangly. God's scary. I mean, God, what are you going to do? Cover up? What are you going to do against God? He starts throwing haymakers. No, no, no. Mutual submission. What do you think, boo? How do you think we should approach this? Here's what I think. Hey, on, on Thursday, what about this? How would you, what would you want to do with this? Money, here's what I'm thinking. And then, after mutual submission, it goes, wives, submit to your husband. And then puts a ton of weight on the men. Just a terrible couple of sentences. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church in that he gave himself up for her. Listen, fellas, it doesn't get harder than that. but I want us to look at complementarity in action. And so Titus chapter two, starting in verse two, here's what it says. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. You want a definition of mature, godly masculinity? There it is. Let's look at it again. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home. I don't think that means you, you can't work outside the home. We'll talk here in a second. Be kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. On the list, that's the only one that overlaps. It's like men and women both need to chill a little bit. Be self-controlled. Be self-controlled. Calm down. Breathe. All right. Why are we yelling? Now, uh, let's finish this. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, have nothing evil to say about us. Our opponents might have. So, so let's look at this in regards to complementarianism. All right. If you have men who, who are being trained in this, you have older men who are training younger men to be this. We're going to be self-controlled. We're not flying off the handle. Think about how much damage men who lack self-control do with their words, with their action, with their size, with their intimidation. But, but what if they were self-controlled? But what if they didn't fly off the handle? What if they weren't governed by their rage? What if they had been discipled in the art of not losing control? What if they modeled good works? What if they spent their lives on serving the king and the kingdom? What if they walked in integrity and in dignity? What, what if they were sound in speech? They used their mouth to build up rather than tear down. And, and where you have a man functioning and growing in that, he's not going to be perfect. He'll be growing towards. He won't be completely in. We know this, right? That's why we need the gospel. That's why grace is so important. But he's growing in this where he stumbles and falls. He's quick to own it before God and before anyone he's harmed. And then it gets into the list of women that older women are training younger women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled and to be pure, 
to work at home. Here's what that, I, I, I just, you can't with the rest of the Bible say women can't work outside the home, all right? I know historically there have been some arguments around that. What's happening here is the woman is very plugged in to the discipleship process that's occurring at home. She is alongside her husband, setting the spiritual climate of the home, encouraging those things. Hey, let's get in there. Daddy's gonna open up the word of God. Let's gather together. She's climbing in bed and cuddling also. I got three kids. If I had to cuddle with all three, I'd fall asleep in one of those beds and just sleep there for the night. I, I, need, I need somebody to help me. Who you want tonight? All right, I got this one. Who's got two? Who's got one? And then the last thing it says here to women is to be kind and submissive to her husband. Um, the amount of power God has given women, wives in particular, on the souls and heart of their husband is staggering. Uh, I learned a long time ago to develop very thick skin and that every time you preach the Bible, some people love it and a lot of people hate it. And, and so, man, I, I learned like college, thick skin. And, and so I, I'm fully confident because it's happened that you could find me after the service, just tell me how much I stink, drop some F-bombs on me, say you'll never be back, all right? Take a whiz out on the foyer and just disappear, and here's what would happen. Um, after security tased you and you got arrested for the urination deal, all right? Yelling at me is just yelling at me. Was that too far? Sometimes I feel like I shouldn't have said that. It's too late now, it's out. Um, if... I would go home. Here's, I really believe that I would just feel bad for you. I wouldn't go, oh man, I stink. You know what? I should probably see if I could get into another career. I mean, I would just feel, I would wonder what type of father wound you have that would make you behave in such a way with even those you disagree with. I would pray and ask the Lord to do a work in your soul and maybe heal whatever wound that is. And, and I would, I, I promise you, I'd pray for you as I drifted off into a really sweet sleep tonight. I just would. I'm not trying to be funny. I, I just have, to, I know how this works. I know, I know some of you even right now are starting to fume. But my wife can destroy me. Like all that thick skin just vanishes with Lauren. I mean, she knows every weakness every bent, every shortcoming, every inconsistency, everything. And so her words can brutalize my heart. Her, her words can keep me up at night going, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> so how is that that you can corner me, cuss me out, tell me I stink at everything and you can't wait for me to die? And I'm like, all right, buddy, praying for you. And I can just go to bed. But Lauren can just hint at displeasure. I'm laying up at night just questioning everything. And some of you might be thinking, bro, you need to develop thicker skin towards your wife. But I, no, no, I don't. Why would I ever sacrifice the emotional, spiritual intimacy I have for my wife for the fear that she might wound me? Listen, she's gonna wound me. She's a sinner. I'm gonna wound her. I'm one. But you never sacrifice intimacy for protection especially not in the covenant of marriage. Now, you can make some arguments when you're dating or courting of wisdom, but once you're married, don't protect yourself. You're going to get hurt, but you're going to get hurt within a covenant that says, I'm not going anywhere. And so he says here, be kind to your husband. You can crush him. Don't do that. Be an expert in his strengths. Don't be an expert in his weaknesses. Where he's doing well, applaud him. Don't just know all the ways he's falling short. He's aware of where he's falling short. He doesn't need your help. But that's getting into next week's sermon. Now, the Bible's saying now at this point where we're doing this, where men are pushing towards this and, and women are gladly underneath this, that our opponents would have nothing to say and that the enemies of the word of God would have nothing to revile. And, and so I can tell you how I think about my home under the weight of the word of God, that if you come into my home, you're gonna see my wife's face beaming. She knows I love her. She knows I'm for her. She knows I find her wildly attractive. 
She's not wondering where my head is, not wondering where my affections are. She knows I am for her gifts being used. I am willing to be sacrificed. She knows my eyes are on her. I'm transfixed with her. I'm crazy about her. You want to know what type of woman I like? I like Lauren. That's what kind of woman. Uh, you like blondes or brunettes. What's she done to her hair this month? That. <laughs> That's what I like right now. If your wife knows this, then any type of you need to be liberated from the man sounds ridiculous. Like if you come in to my home, my wife is gladly flourishing in her gifts, feels loved and romanced and cherished. And all of that is work, fellas. That's not easy. That's planned. That's sit down, look at the calendar. That's little notifications to just text her something cute. And you can giggle at me, but I'm telling you, that type of discipline you take towards sports and following your favorite team, if you'd put that on your wife, she wouldn't think you're such a jack. (laughs) And so look at the ladies clap. (laughs) You're sitting next to him. You're not helping. (laughs) Right? And so... If we live this way, what would the world have to say about us? So like the idea that I'm talking about here, strong husbands, submissive wives, that's kind of painted as this kind of archaic, broken, how dare we think about women in that way. And I'm telling you that the Bible says where this is lived out accurately, the world's got nothing to say. They could attack the idea, but if they ate dinner with you, they'd apologize. That if they got anywhere near you, saw your children, saw how you loved your wife, saw how you submitted to your husband, they'd go, gosh, that's what I really want. Now, if all you've ever been around is idiot men, I can see why this would unsettle you. But you can't take the lowest common denominator and make him normative. You can if I can take the lowest common denominator in regards to what I've come across in women and make her normative. Because you know the, the Bible, I don't want to preach next week's sermon, but you know the Bible says that it's better for a man to die in the desert than to live in the house with a contemptuous woman? Think about that. God's going, dang, bro. <laughs> really, it'd be best for you just to wander into the desert and die <laughs> than to live in this house. So let's be careful not, not to make the lowest common denominator in regards to the men you've come across and know as, as somehow the average or the norm. And and we'll agree not to take the lowest common denominator in regards to women and make her the norm. No, where this happens, flourishing occurs. And the world might attack the idea, but they'll only attack the idea because they haven't seen it practiced. Because to see it practiced is to have your mouth hushed. It's really kind of awesome. Now, With that said, that's complementarianism in the home. Now let's look at the church. Now what we see clearly in the New Testament is women as needed and necessary in the flourishing of the church body. In Acts 8, 4, women are almost certainly included in the list of disciples who went everywhere preaching the gospel. Older women are to teach younger women. We see that in Titus 2. Priscilla helped her husband Aquila teach Apollos. That's Acts 18. Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And then women prayed and prophesied in the gathering at the church in Corinth. So that women are not only needed and necessary, but they are indispensable and essential in the life of the church. Now, before we we kind of get deeply into this. Let me chat to single women very quickly. Because if I'm saying here that the purpose of the woman is to be a helpmate or a helper fit for him and you're not married, how does this work? What does it mean to be a helpmate if you are single? Well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you're supposed to sit around and wait for a husband. All right. In the Old Testament, the blessing was children. In the New Testament, the blessing was disciples. So don't sit around twiddling your thumbs waiting for some man. Please don't do that. The kingdom of God is at hand and you've been called to actively play a part. Why would you sit around wanting dinner and a movie when the great epic adventure in the universe is at play and you've been invited in? 
Let me give you some examples. Here at Flower Mound, right down the hallway in Kids Village is Ann Lincoln Hollenbaugh. I met Ann Lincoln when she was in college. We go way back. Uh, Ann Lincoln, every weekend, will run our ministry to first through fifth graders. There'll be over 400 of them this weekend. There are 120 volunteers. There are three on her staff, and she is one of the most gifted theologians I've ever been around, a ferocious single woman of God. I'm telling you, when you dropped your first through fifth grader off in there, they're, they're again, they're not learning moralism, all right? Today, they're learning that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. So what they're hearing today is God's your refuge. I, I don't know what's going on at home. I don't know what's going on physically. I don't know what's going on in school. I don't know if you're being bullied. I don't know if you're loved and cared for at home, but here's what you can know. God is your refuge. God is there for you. God has not abandoned you. God loves you. And right now, led by Ann Lincoln, Catherine Hollenbaugh, a 30-year-old single woman, she is actively making disciples out of our children. My children have grown under her care and under her leadership. And praise God, she has not sat around and just waited for some dude to invite her to dinner. So don't do that, single ladies. I mean, I can go on and on. We got Courtney Nance up in Denton. If we got off of staff, we could talk about Tara Lee Cobble, another um, single woman in our midst. She runs a ministry called D Groups, over a thousand women um, that have been discipled under her organization in 10 different states. And not emotive devotionals like her group memorized Romans 8 this fall. Been walking through a systematic book. Praise God she's not. And listen, they have desires. They want to be married. That's a good, right desire. But they're not sitting around waiting for it. Well, I guess I can't do anything until I... No, that's ridiculous. Don't do that. You have so much more value than that. Again, the blessing is disciples. And then down, I'm thinking Dallas Carly Pickens. If you know anything of Champions of Hope, Champions of Hope was started by Carly Pickens, a young 20-something single who had a real desperate heart to serve some of the poorest of the poor and, and began to mentor young men and women and then began to gather her friends and mentor young men and women. That thing's turned into a monstrosity down in Dallas where the poorest of the poor and the most difficult schools imaginable being ministered to. It's flowing through their students and into their homes and, and the church is being able to serve them all because uh, a single woman who I assume, I've never had this conversation with Carly, would like to be married has moved into a difficult part of Dallas and is with a group of other faithful men and women serving down there and making disciples. What does it look like to be a helpmate if you're single? It means not waiting around for a husband. It means understanding that the kingdom of God is at hand. It, it means giving yourself over, having yourself wrung out, taking the hill. We don't know how many days we have, so we give ourselves over to training younger women, teaching and exercising our gifts in any and every way we possibly can made available to us. The only caveat we ever see in the Bible around this is that we don't, women don't exercise their gifts in a way that emasculates men or usurps their authority. Run and teach and train and have yourself poured out for the glory of God and the good of the church. You're indispensable. We have to have you. Quit waiting around for some doofus to ask you out. And, and then just in, and one more note on single women. I, I found this response. I've gotten it twice now. I want to make sure I never get it again. I'm not trying to shame anybody if you're in here and you said this to me. I feel like people get nervous talking to me now because I do things like this, so, um, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, if you're a, a single woman in here and you're like, Chandler, man, if I grow strong like that, if I, if I get, um, you know, deeper theologically, if I, I'm just, I'm nervous that, that young men would be intimidated and wouldn't approach me. You do not want to make yourself dumber to get a man. I get it. I, I keep trying to save you from the ridiculousness of this age. You being dumber than you should be in order to attract an even dumber man. <laughs> uh, ser seriously, I know we're giggling here. 
How does this in any way serve God or you ultimately? Do you see how you're sowing seeds even in that moment of resentment and bitterness later? No, so here, let me just share my heart for all women, married or single, here at the Village Church. I don't desire, and the elders do not desire, that you would be um, pat your head, bless her heart, type of be quiet, ask when we get home. Women, grow in a knowledge of the Word of God. Strengthen your mind as much as possible. Do not be satisfied with emotive devotionals. Get in the deep end of the pool. Grow theologically. Grow in your gifting. Practice and exercise your gifts to make disciples for the glory of God. Be the type of women who are iron that sharpen the iron of your husbands and male friends. And young men. Don't be intimidated by women who are more theologically informed and educated than you are. They might just help your dumb self. <laughs> you might just find, oh gosh, I'm uncomfortable here. Let me start reading more than I Xbox. Just saying, that's helpful. Have that kind of pressure on you. Um, uh, her strengths should complement your weaknesses, right? That it's complementary in relationships. Ladies, we want you to thrive. We want you to grow. We want you to utilize your gifts. And, and we want big minds and big hearts. And I'm saying, Matt Chandler, lead pastor, one of the elders, on behalf of the elders, we need you. Make disciples. And listen, if you're a mom of three, four, five, I mean, we, like I said, we're a happy campus. Um, and you're going, man, how, how does this work? I'm so busy. Well, listen, primary discipleship responsibility is in the home. But that has not stopped my wife from dragging our kids all over the planet. And so I, I love my wife, Lauren. She is, and, and listen, don't do any fairy tale. Oh, right now, we fought big this weekend. All right, not, not last month when we were in a fight, like literally Friday and Saturday, the temperature in the Chandler house was a little... Right? It was just, we had a flare up, all right? had to handle it, godly wise, but we had to handle it. And, and so don't over romanticize what I'm about to say. Now, I love my wife, like just a brilliant mind. She's smarter than me, boom, down, I, I said it. Graduated in three and a half years, summa cum laude, no summer school. She decided on a trip to Mexico to clep out of Spanish and came back and did it. Who does that? Who just like, well, I've watched Spanish TV for three days. So I think I'll clip out of collegiate Spanish. And then comes back and does it. I mean, she just held the book for a second, somehow absorbed the information in it, and then tested it out. She's brilliant and not just book smart, street smart. And she's not afraid of me. She will engage me often and respectfully around my heirs. If I push too hard with one of the kids, if I've been irresponsible, if I've been quick to say something foolish, if I downshift into my critical spirit. She's quick to point me out. You need to give them the benefit of the doubt. Always with respect, always with honor, but not afraid in any way of me. And I praise God that she's that strong. If God would have given me some bless your heart, sweet, I don't want to read, I just want to cook, uh, that things would, I just would be half the man that I am. Like I'm telling you, I, I sit down with Lauren, I'm, I go over my weekend notes. What do you think here, boo? How, how does this hit? What do you think here? Oh, this sentence, I just think this would be better if this isn't actually a word. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> There's a lot of that that goes on. Are you sure you're pronouncing this right? <laughs> Why would you clap at that? Anyway. In the community that we live in, in the community that our lives are playing out in, the number one felt need and, and the easiest kind of breakdown to spot is the family. Adultery, divorce, broken homes, aggression. We, I'm telling you, we're living in Camelot. You hear me, y'all? Like we all look pretty, got our pretty cars. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, brother? <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I, I have 
not the privilege, but the heartache of watching you watch me take notes, raise your hand while you're having an affair on your wife. I get to watch that every week. I get to watch you listen, take notes, raise your hands, clap your hands, knowing that you're using your mouth to belittle, demean, and emasculate your husbands. I get to watch it week in and week out. It's heartbreaking. It's a near impossible wait sometimes to know all I can do is preach and hope. What would happen, though, in this community? What would happen if men stepped into this role and were serious about it? What would happen if women, and I'm not trying to land the plane on this series. We've still got several weeks. What would happen if, if women stepped into this role and flourished? What a bright light would the village church be in this city if the marriages here were flourishing? If men were very, very serious about cultivating their wives so they look like what the Bible calls a well-watered vine. What would happen in this place if women were experts in the strengths of their husbands so that there would never be any word mentioned about their husband negatively, even in their own minds, because they were so aware of the good that their husbands do? What, what kind of bright light would we be in this community? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. We would attract a lot of busted up marriages as they flocked to the light in the hopes that the gospel would work in them. Now, uh, all cards on the table always. Men, you will fail at this. The task is impossible. That's why you need grace. Women, you will fail at this. You have no real shot. This is why we need grace. This is why the cross is so spectacular. It's why we had better lean in. But the process that leads to human flourishing is the ongoing ethic of confession and repentance and getting up and continuing to pursue. That's what marks us. That's what moves us. May we never believe we're there, but rather en route. Men are called to exercise biblical headship. It is the unique leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. And women are called to walk in what is called being a biblical helpmate. That's a woman who serves God, serves God in helping the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. And I pray to this end, we will labor. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. I pray that where we have fallen short of these things, you would encourage our hearts as men and as women. I pray even on drives home today, we'd be quick to own our sin, quick to own where we have not done the things that you have called us to, quick to lean into your grace and mercy and forgiveness. Help us, we need you. It's not a bad thing to fall short, it's a thing that sends us to you for mercy and help. Remind our hearts today. It's for your beautiful name, amen.